Let's turn to the Maldives now. Their government seems to be having a rethink. After all the anti-India rants, after all the insults, Mali is now appealing to Indian tourists. First, their tour operators reached out. They started organizing roadshows in Indian cities. And now the tourism minister is on the job. Listen to what he said. I'm quoting, our people and the government will give a warm welcome to Indian arrivals. As the tourism minister, I want to tell Indians to please be part of the Maldives' tourism. Our economy depends on tourism. How about that? A personal appeal from the tourism minister of the Maldives, which raises two questions. One, what triggered it? And two, is it genuine? The minister answered the first question himself. He said the Maldivian economy depends on tourism, no tourists, no revenue. And Indian tourists are not traveling to the Maldives, not like before. Just look at the data from last year. Between January and April, more than 73,000 Indians visited the Maldives. And this year, just under 44,000. So Indian arrivals are down 42%. China, the UK and Russia have overtaken India. You can thank boycott movements for that. In January, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited Lakshadweep Islands. He also posted pictures of the trip. But some Maldivian ministers insulted the Indian PM. Of course, this triggered a huge backlash in India. Many tourists said they would boycott the Maldives. And looks like they, they actually are doing it. Hence, Mali's desperation. They've set an ambitious target this year to welcome 2 million foreign tourists. But without India, it will be hard. Which brings us to the second question. Is the appeal genuine? For tourists, maybe. But it's too early to call this a U-turn by the Maldives. They're still looking beyond India. Last week, a Turkish warship visited the Maldives. The ship's commander also met top Maldivian officials, including the defense minister. And don't look at this voyage in isolation. Back in November, President Mohammed Muizu traveled to Turkey. It was a huge break from tradition. Usually, Maldivian presidents visit India first after taking office. But Muizu visited Turkey instead. He also bought Turkish drones, the Bayraktar TB2 drones, for $37 million. Again, this was an escalation because India and Turkey do not see eye to eye. The relationship is largely hostile. Yet, Muizu bought drones from Turkey. Same with China. He visited the country before traveling to India. He also signed a number of deals with them. So don't expect Muizu's policy to change. This is more of a financial appeal. And how should India see it? So far, New Delhi has been patient with Muizu. He asked Indian soldiers to leave the Maldives, and India agreed. Muizu had set a deadline for Indian soldiers to withdraw, May 10th, the deadline, which is this Friday. Around half of the soldiers have already been pulled out. The rest will follow soon. So India has shown a lot of goodwill. No criticism, no outbursts. The response from New Delhi has been measured. But has that measured response swayed Moizu? Doesn't look like, it, look like it has. India Out was a campaign pitch for Mohammed Moizu, a pitch that worked not once but twice. The Maldives held parliamentary elections last month. Moizu's party swept the country. They ended up with a supermajority in parliament. So why would, he present, why would he abandon a winning strategy? Why would the president do it? Logic says he won't. But politics is a tricky business. You campaign in poetry, but you govern in prose. And that's what Moizu is doing. He talks about decoupling with India, but he knows it will be tough. It will take time. He wants to do it with minimal blowback. Hence these appeals and softening rhetoric. In fact, the Maldivian foreign minister is visiting India this week. He will meet India's external affairs minister, S.J. Shankar. It's actually the first high-level visit since Moizu took charge. The foreign minister will be arriving on May 9th. So just one day before Moizu's deadline expires. And this visit should give us an idea about what lies ahead. More hostility or a working relationship? First Post reports from the world's second largest continent. Hello, I'm Alison Lagrange. A very warm welcome from Durban, South Africa. We get you the news and the newsmakers from Africa. South Africa goes to the polls on the 29th of May. I will track the election and bring you ground reports. Is it the end of the road for the African National Congress? And will former President Jacob Zuma stage a dramatic comeback? From elections, to climate change, to innovations, and opportunities. 
As the world's attention shifts, we report from Africa, the heart of the Global South. Join me every weekday live on First Post.